Well, I think we'll just keep things rolling. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Nieser and Jan Zalud, and they're going to be talking in the next module about managing weeds using drones, a new project that Chris has been working on. So I know there's a lot of people that, uh, that are really a lot of interest and in talk about the use of drone technology in agriculture. So <laughs> take advantage and ask as many questions as you can. And later on, I think we might even have a, a bit of a simulation. Is that possible? Or? I guess, yeah, we could. Yeah? Yeah, yeah? Could drop water balloons on you guys a little later. <laughs> okay, so thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. As, as uh, I was introduced, I'm Chris Nasa. I work for Alberta Agriculture out of Brooks uh, with the Pest Surveillance Branch. And uh, oh, about a year and a half ago, Jan came to uh, my office and he was introduced himself and showed what he's had and what he was planning to do. And I hadn't really heard much about these uh, UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, are also called commonly drones until up to that point. But it really piqued my interest and I thought, yeah, that may have applications uh, for what I'm doing. I'm dealing with weeds and perhaps other things such as uh, diseases. And so I talked to a colleague of mine who's a pathologist, uh, Mike Harding, you might have heard about him, and uh, asked him what he thinks of it. And he thought, well, maybe for some disease it might be useful. So we put together a project and uh, we gave it that title that you have in your hand out there. It says... Perf we look at the performance and cost of field scouting for weeds and diseases using imagery obtained with an unmanned aerial vehicle. Right? Unmanned, right? And woman too. Now on in there. <laughs> All right, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we started out and, and the, the, the objective we had with this project was uh, it's stated there in two bullets. Uh, one, to develop a, a protocol on how to acquire and process this kind of imagery. And secondly, to determine uh, how accurate or useful this is, as well as how much it would cost to, to do it. Right? So, uh, because these are of course questions, you know, everyone uh, is excited about this new technology, looking at these kinds of little airplanes, who wouldn't like to play with that, right? And I know lots of farmers would like to think about buying one, or they already have one. I want to mount a 22 on one. There you go. <laughs> there are all sorts of applications, right? Now, but uh, is this just a toy or is it actually something that will help you make money? So, the approach I'm taking to this with this project is to basically look at it from a remote sensing point of view. And if any of you have dealt with the remote sensing, uh, you know that when, you, when it comes to vegetation and crops, you're dealing with uh, or you're using uh, what, what's called NDVI maps, uh, basically, or NDVI images. Now, what NDVI stands for in this context is uh, the uh, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Now, without going too much into the math of this, it's, it's basically a ratio of the near-infrared plus a visible, some portion of the visible spectrum, typically the red, over the near infrared, oh, got that wrong. It's near infrared minus a portion of the visible spectrum over the near infrared plus a portion of the, of the visible spectrum. So, what that does is the ratio increases as you have more vegetation, and the ratio decreases as you have less uh, vegetation, soil that is. So, in the extreme case, soil would be minus one. And the other extreme vegetation would be plus one. The values are typically be between minus one and plus one. Now, to explain this a little further, please uh, look at your handout. And on the second page there, you have an, a diagram about infrared, <coughs> uh, about the whole the whole light spectrum actually. And you'll see that there is a uh, uh, just after the, the rainbow color there, there is something called the near IR. So this is the part of the spectrum that uh, that plant plants and leaves reflect most, right? Now, if you, and that means it goes from 700 to uh, about uh, 900 some uh, nanometers. Now, all of the rather I mean, so those of you who are familiar with uh, infrared thermometers, like those who can measure the temperature and distance, it doesn't deal with near infrared. That's way further to the to the right, with much longer wavelength. 
right? So the near infrared we're dealing with is not the temperature infrared. So it's not the thing that the, the army uses, you know, to detect, uh, I don't know, enemy soldiers in, in, at night vision. No? So the way to do this, to capture such images is traditionally, of course, you get a multispectral camera, which tend to be expensive. Now, when we say expensive, that makes, of course, the operation expensive and increases the cost. So other ways to, like, when you look at this equipment, this doesn't look like multi-million dollar equipment, right? So uh, how can we reduce the cost? And we do this by using commercial cameras, as you can see there, just ordinary, the top of the uh, ordinary cameras that you might buy at Walmart, wherever. And they're modified because the sensors, the sensors they have, the common sensors, they naturally do capture the near infrared spectrum, except that the cameras are equipped with a filter to filter that out. So what we do, we modify those cameras for that purpose, put in a filter, and this is what the second diagram there shows, below that uh, infrared thing, is you, you replace one of the filters, the, so that the infrared absorption filter, with one that lets the infrared through and blocks out the red. So now your camera is no longer uh, red, uh, green, blue, but now it is uh, near infrared, uh, green and blue, right? So that's what you capture. So another part of that uh, remote sensing, oh well, let's go to the other graphs first to, just to further illustrate the, uh, this idea with the reflection of the near infrared. Uh, you have these graphs here, the next page. So that the, the top one only shows <coughs> the absorption of uh, the, uh, the light, the way light is absorbed by plants. So you can see when you look at the green, yeah, of course, uh, plants absorb the, uh, the, 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 um, from 400 to 500, and then when it comes into the green from 500 to 600, it's not absorbed, that means it's reflected. The, uh, and then uh, when you go beyond 700, it's not absorbed either. So that's where the near infrared starts. So the, the, when you look at the bottom graph, when it, it's, you, and the green line, you see it, it really shows up, it really shoots up once you pass the 700. So this is the near infrared, and that's why it's so important, because the near infrared, it really shows up, it really makes plants stand out in a picture. And of course, the more plants there is, the better the canopy, the more photosynthesis, in other words, the more of that near infrared you get. Now, when you're taking a, when you're talking about remote sensing, uh, resolution is in, uh, something uh, of interest, of course, because the greater the resolution, the more detail you can see. Right? So the, the kind of resolution we're able to get with this camera uh, is about uh, six centimeters per pixel. And this is what this uh, picture uh, illustrates there. Now, uh, this one here. Uh, so six centimeters per pixel, you can't see individual small leaves, right? But you can see, uh, between rows, so crop rows stand out quite easily. Even. So the way we go up, we go about this. Well, what is really involved in the process is first of all, of course, uh, that's what Jan would be talking about is the, the mechanics of acquiring the image. So once we have the image, there are many images acquired for one quarter section. So this is what this picture shows. And uh, you only show up there are about 100 and 120 pictures we need per quarter section. There has to be considerable overlap between images. These images are then stitched together to form a, uh, a, whole, a whole field image. This is what you can see uh, to the right of that, uh, uh, of that uh, explanation here. And then become, uh, comes a, a second important step, a last step, which is to rectify the image so that it, it's true to scale. Because of course, when you're flying, the airplane moves and uh, there's all sorts of distortions that could happen. Now we want to rectify that, so we call this an auto image, that when we take measurements on the image, it's uh, accurate, relatively accurate. Like you, the, the more accurate, of course, you want it, the more, the, the more precautions you have to do. Now, now we, we do this by adding ground, uh, uh, true, uh, ground reference points uh, to, to the image for which we know the exact location, like uh, GPS locations. And this is what the bottom image shows. So the, those, those markers show up on the image and we do, use those to rectify the image. So now we have an auto image with near infrared, which is the red color. So the near infrared shows up as red. And this is what shows you then the vegetation. And this is something that you can 
uh, actually take measures on. You know, the, the measurements would be uh, fairly accurate. And uh, the accuracy, for the purpose of this project, we don't need a centimeter accuracy. You know, we are, we are happy with a half a meter or so. So that's what we're aiming at. And then we get that kind of accuracy. On the next page, I'm showing you, this is this page here, what the differences would look like in different, uh, when you're working with different colors, right? So you can modify those colors. So we can uh, basically uh, convert what I said, the, the NIR channel to make it show up like a, 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 a red channel again. So as, as to obtain basically the natural color, right? So the middle image shows you by uh, the, 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 the image modified uh, so that, so that it, it appears like as if it were a normal photograph. It doesn't, it's not 100% the same because of course your red and your infrared isn't the same. I mean, your infrared is a much stronger, shows up much more strongly than, than uh, your red. So, so the, the, the green is, is exaggerated. That's why you have a, a, gr a green hue in the image. Nevertheless, on, on the right side, you see the, the, the full zoom, like assuming it out, we see the whole field and, and the, the, at 100%. At so when it's at 100%, this is the image when you uh, zoom in to, so as the, so to make the, the screen display all the pixels without doing any uh, compression, any uh, zooming in, basically. And then the last one is the NDVI one. Now, the NDVI, as I said, this is just a single channel. You just take uh, the calculated values and you create a color image that is uh, just an arbitrary color ramp. And in this case, I made it from green to red, just so to uh, make it more intuitive. And you can see uh, this is a potato field. It was taken in uh, the beginning of uh, middle of June, more or less middle of June. And you can see the areas that show up in green on the, on the bottom right there in the field. Those are, this is not, uh, these are the, the parts where the, the, uh, the amount of uh, NIR reflected is on the high end. So that doesn't only, it's not just the, the actual area that, is, that was, the growth occurred, but it was more than, t more than uh, in other areas, right? So it stands out. Now this is uh, when it comes to uh, looking for weeds, this may be something that we may, may be useful for uh, detecting weed patches uh, in, in fields, you know, that uh, at, at the early stages, uh, just after seeding or when, when, you, when you have to make decisions about your, your weed control. So in the next page, there's an example of what this in, would look like in this field, in this page here. On the lower right of that image, you have an area that is sort of a green patch, it's circled in yellow. Right? So I, I zoomed into this area and you can see it, what it looks like. Now in the field, we, we did a ground check of this area. See what, what happened, what is, what's actually going on in this area. And you see the, the actual photograph there of what, what's happening. It's, it's full of uh, wild buckwheat. Right? So there, there was wild buckwheat growing uh, between the rows. Oh, and this shows up as, as this green, green patch on, on the aerial image. So we can uh, clearly find patches of weeds in, in fields early in the season. However, when you're walking in the field and making a weed management decisions, so often you have just a, a little seedling coming out here, another one there, you know, and you walk a little more, another one. So they're not patches. And, and at that level, with that kind of resolution, we can't see that. We can only see where there are actual patches of weeds that, that, are, uh, that fill at least half a row or so that they show up. All right, and I uh, just want to finish off by acknowledging my sponsors here. For this project, we had uh, quite a few sponsors. I think we have six uh, 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 commodity groups. Uh, the Alberta Canola Commission, we have uh, ACIDEF that sponsored uh, uh, the, and put the project together with the different uh, commissions. We have the Alberta Pulse Growers, Alberta Wheat, Western Grains, and the PGA as well as the, Alba, the Alfalfa Seed Commission. Now, uh, having all these sponsors on board, uh, that uh, reminds me that we have, uh, we are covering crops that uh, are for each of these uh, different uh, uh, commodity groups. So we have two fields that we do for each of these crops. Uh, and uh, we are uh, covering, um, well, most of the fields are actually in the, the, the Nihil uh, Starland County, but we have some in uh, the County of Newell. Yeah, the remainder would be in the County of Newell. So, uh, and we will be doing this, so we did it, uh, the, the three, uh, three runs. The first run was uh, end of May, beginning of June. And then we're starting the second run. And then there will be a third run uh, 
end of towards the end of August. So uh, each of these uh, pictures will show different things that grow up at different growth stages and different types of problems. Right. And with that, I pass it on to Jan. He will uh, talk a little bit about the mechanics of this. Right. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Jan Zalud. I'm the uh, owner and operator, I guess, of uh, JZ Aerial. It's a business that I started about uh, three years ago. And uh, uh, it's really taken off, uh, uh, especially this time of season is, uh, is really busy. Uh, I'm just going to touch on roughly kind of what we do, uh, the main types of uh, products that, uh, that we produce, uh, some of which you know, Chris mentioned, and uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, the uh, different drones we use and uh, uh, the, uh, some of the, uh, the applications and, uh, and the benefits uh, specifically as it relates to, uh, to agriculture. Uh, so we, uh, adjacent aerial, uh, we specialize in professional uh, aerial imagery uh, and aerial photography services across Alberta. Uh, we focus right now on uh, two main markets, that being agriculture and real estate. And for each of these, because of their unique natures, we have, uh, we have different uh, drones or UAVs, so to speak. Uh, so for agriculture, we have uh, the fixed wing guy right here. That's our workhorse. Uh, these are great for covering larger areas of, uh, of land for, for mapping purposes. And uh, then for uh, real estate, we uh, use uh, this is called a multi-rotor. Uh, this one has six rotors, so it's called a hexacopter. And uh, this one uh, this one hovers uh, wherever you kind of put it in the sky. And uh, so it's great for uh, uh, just uh, kind of oblique shots uh, uh, of uh, uh, in, in real estate. Uh, we do a lot of work for, uh, for realtors uh, looking at uh, taking pictures of uh, usually luxury uh, homes, acreages, ranches, uh, farms, uh, even raw land. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was down in uh, Pincher Creek uh, doing uh, actually 22 uh, quarter sections uh, for, uh, for a client, a uh, realtor client. Uh, uh, also got shot at actually by some psycho lady living in the mountains who didn't like me hovering over uh, her house. Uh, so uh, lucky for her, she's a bad shot. <laughs> Uh, we just heard uh, some uh, shots, uh, you know, ringing out as the helicopter was hovering kind of behind us. And then the next day I found out that uh, she placed a call to the realtor complaining that somebody was spying on her. And, you know, I think it's just someone, you know, watching yeah, too many uh, uh, evil drone films or something. But anyway, you know, happy ending. So it was good. Uh, so that's uh, so these are the two main tools that we have for each of the different markets uh, on the real estate side. Uh, we, uh, it's mostly just uh, stills that we take, uh, pictures kind of obliques uh, from the helicopter from down where the camera sits. Um, and uh, this one here, with this airplane now, we have a, a little housing. I can just lift it, maybe show you. You can see uh, this is where the camera sits in this little housing over here. And, uh, and it basically as the plane flies, it just takes pictures straight down. And we have, uh, we have special uh, programs uh, that get uploaded to the autopilot that uh, fly, basically allow the plane to fly a grid pattern across a quarter section, which is what it's uh, programmed for. And, uh, and it takes uh, pictures every roughly 2.8 seconds. So we get the required uh, overlaps uh, forward as well as side laps as it goes uh, across the field. And as Chris mentioned, uh, to cover a quarter section, uh, it takes about uh, between 110 and 120 individual pictures that it snaps. And uh, then uh, off-site, we process them into uh, one big, uh, ortho mosaic as we call them uh, which is what you saw in uh, in the handouts Does it only make one pass on a quarter section? no it's 11 passes and i'm told that uh, we might actually do a demo later maybe after lunch or whenever so uh, uh so you'll be able to see uh, uh let me see. go get my gun <laughs> yeah maybe hold off to the gun yeah <laughs> is it remotely flown uh it's uh well it's both actually uh it's uh uh, it's uh, just by, I guess by law, we have to be able to always take over in, in the manual mode and, uh, and fly it manually. Uh, but uh, it's programmed, to, this one is fully autonomous, which means that uh, once uh, it gets hand launched and it uh, just starts uh, on a positive rate of climb, uh, you s flick a switch on the transmitter and uh, the autopilot takes over and, uh, and it just does everything by itself after. It lines up at the first waypoint and then uh, starts tracking the waypoints back and forth across the field until it's done. And then it comes back to the home base, which is the station basically. And uh, the way that we have it programmed is uh, it descends uh, from the 600 feet uh, at which it maps, 600 feet, uh, descends to about 300, and then it would just circle indefinitely over our location once it comes back. Uh, it's, uh, it's set up like that for safety because sometimes uh, things are occurring, there could be turbulence or something. So 
might you know I might need another extra minute or so before landing so uh, it just basically would circle and it just uh, it's a little bit uh, less of a workload to figure out where I'm gonna land what the best approach is and so forth so so that's how this one works and it's all battery operated it's not gas part or anything like that so uh, there are lithium batteries that you put in and uh, uh, and you have to put enough that uh, to make them last for the full quarter <laughs> so uh, that's what it is and uh, this antenna here basically talks to the antenna on the mast which talks to the laptop and uh, so we get basically a, a live uh, telemetry link uh, between the airplane uh, on the laptop so we can see exactly where it is, what it's doing and monitor during flight. So that's, that's the technology. Um, as far as the products go, uh, on the aerial mapping side, uh, Chris mentioned we, uh, the main uh, types of products we produce are uh, ortho maps, which are geo-referenced uh, uh, mosaics uh, of, uh, of fields in this case. And uh, uh, geo-referencing we do uh, could be done with a handheld, uh, just a receiver off the shelf. Uh, we could also do a uh, sub-meter using RTK or static GPS uh, systems uh, for uh, anyone who's, uh, who requires uh, a sub-meter, even down to just a centimeter level accuracy. So that's possible as well. Um, the other type of product we provide is something called a digital elevation model. And I have a sample of that here. You can always come and have a look at it closer, but uh, this, is, this is actually a, a, a digital elevation model of a, a golf course in Calgary that we mapped. And what it is, is it's like a 3D animation of uh, the, the terrain, right? So you get, uh, you get the, uh, the peaks and valleys uh, of uh, the area of interest that you're shooting. And, uh, so What's the horizontal accuracy of that? Digital uh, this one we just did with a handheld receiver, so it's like the you know, one and a half meter. But uh, you can do it with uh, RTK Yeah, it could be done now, yeah. So it could be way more accurate as well, actually. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's one, and you could do uh, volumetric calculations with, with uh, these kind of imageries as well, not just area calculations. So that's where the usefulness comes in as well. What's your vertical accuracy? Uh, vertical, uh, again, depends on uh, the, uh, uh, what receiver you're using, you know. So these uh, off-the-shelf ones, it's, it's like, it's usually uh, three times worse than what the horizontal is. So, uh, you know, it's gonna be like four and a half, five meters, right, basically. But if you use the RTK GPS or the static GPS uh, stations, uh, you know, you could be looking at uh, horizontal, maybe two centimeters and, you know, five, six centimeters uh, vertically. Um, and uh, the accuracy actually of using the UAVs, uh, it's, uh, it, it also uh, is uh, greater than maybe other systems because of those overlaps that we're using. Because uh, with the, we use, uh, it's roughly a 50% overlap uh, going forward with the imagery and about 30% side. So for each point on, uh, on the surface, for example, the tarps we use as ground control points, you know, we usually have four to five individual images that capture that point. So uh, uh, the more images you have capturing each individual point, the greater the accuracy, because you get that triangulation going, right? You get, uh, you get to look at the same spot from different angles, basically, as the plane is passing over, okay? Um, we also do a contour map overlays. So it's basically, a, you know, if you know what a topo map is, right? You get those little overly little lines uh, for elevations. So we could do that as well for people. We did that for a, a client uh, for their acreage. They were looking for, they're gonna be doing some renovation. And uh, so that's just uh, kind of an add-on that, uh, that we also do. And I mentioned the survey gray, uh, uh, gray georeferencing as well. And of course the volumetric uh, calculations can be done now as well and area calculations. Um, so if you have a uh, area of concern in the field uh, from that you'll see from the imagery, uh, you can figure out exactly where it is located in the field and how many acres are affected. So uh, it becomes very valuable that way. Uh, so in terms of some of the applications that uh, you know, some were mentioned already, uh, you know the UAV technologies uh, can help you identify things like insufficient uh, moisture levels uh, in the field or excessive moisture levels, uh, weed growth insect or pest infestations or other damage, hail damage obviously, uh, treatment, uh, uh, responses to different treatments uh, uh, when you're comparing different uh, brands of treatment for example or different rates, uh, it, it comes through as well. Uh, we're doing some, uh, some of that uh, actually with Farming Smarter last year, uh, remember that. Uh, field traffic patterns is another possible application. I can see soil compaction now quite uh, clearly. Uh, water runoff and irrigation problem areas. If you have a nozzle out on it on the irrigation pivot, uh, you know eventually that will come through as well in the imagery. Um, 
as well as delineations of uh, uniform zones across the field, which could be useful for uh, prescription maps, for example. So in terms of the overall benefits uh, of, uh, of these technologies, uh, uh, you know, they offer a very cost-effective, time-saving way of, uh, 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 of acquiring timely and uh, in-field, uh, in-season uh, air imagery of, uh, uh, of uh, the crops and crop performance. And uh, so it helps uh, you, the grower, again, identify the exact location of, uh, of areas of concern or problem areas. And, uh, and, and to help you determine exactly uh, how many acres are affected. So that's, uh, that's about what I had to say. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm sure we could, uh, if we have time, we could take questions, or you can come and have a look at uh, this more closely. Any questions? Is this stuff regulated at all through transport? Canada? Yes, it is, yeah. We have to have a permit. Uh, it's called a special flight, op flight operation certificate. And uh, so anyone operating these uh, for commercial purposes uh, has to have these permits. And it uh, used to be actually quite uh, a challenge to uh, do any kind of business uh, around these because they take, uh, you know, right now they're like four or five months out basically if you apply, you know, that's how long you have to wait to get one. Uh, but uh, what we succeeded in doing is uh, getting uh, basically a, a season-wide coverage uh, and, and permit, which is really the only way you can uh, do this kind of operation. So. I have a, an annual uh, kind of a you know, 12 month uh, permit and I have it for most of Alberta. So I can pretty much go wherever I need to. All I need to do is just uh, notify uh, Transport Canada where I'm gonna be when, you know, give them kind of the details. So I do that. You fly here then, is Medicine Hat Flight Service notified? Uh, well, this one would kind of have to be, you know, just a quick little thing. Uh, no one knows, cause I wasn't planning on doing any demo. But uh, if we just do it for you know a couple of minutes, I'm, I wouldn't do a whole quarter. We could do a few passes just so you guys can see. You know, I think uh, I think they'll forgive me. We won't tell anyone. There you go. <laughs> You're off camera. <laughs> well, how long would it take to do a quarter? How long to do a quarter? Uh, it takes 20 minutes uh, from the time you take off, actually, uh, to do a quarter. Uh, so while uh, the setup is about 15 minutes, uh, another maybe. 15 uh, to lay out the tarps for our ground control points if we're georeferencing the field and then uh, 20 minutes to fly and uh, and then you know another 15 to kind of pack things up and go <laughs> so what the actual flight time is about 20 minutes is what it takes to do uh, uh, what it takes to do the 11 passes and they're spaced out uh, forget what it is uh, I think 60 feet apart roughly something like that so <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, I have it based on uh, like a per, qu uh, per quarter cost because basically that's what we fly. Uh, so uh, uh, it's uh, to do uh, one ortho of, uh, of a quarter section, like one visit uh, is uh, 850, 850. And uh, for uh, both, uh, and that ortho could be an NDVI ortho or a true color. And anyone that wants both, it's 1200. And that's, uh, things go like down from there. Not downhill, just down. Um, it's, uh, you know, the more we do per day, right, uh, you know, then uh, we develop a discount for you for that. Uh, if we have a project where we do a lot of uh, fields uh, uh, per project, you know, then again, that impacts the price. So that's the starting point. Then we go down from there just because, you know, to go somewhere 400 kilometers for a quarter section, you know, it's not very cost effective, right? So you should fly. You should fly there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the other thing is uh, with those regulations is that uh, you always have to maintain uh, a line of sight of these UAVs. So really that quarter section, uh, that it's kind of the limit uh, is, uh, you know, you can see this, uh, it's a tiny dot, but you could still see it uh, diagonally across the field, you know, when it's like 4,000 feet out. Uh, but any further than that, then it just, uh, you know, we'd be on line of sight, which is just not permitted. So, um, and, uh, and the other thing is, uh, uh, most of those permits, uh, they give you uh, flying at uh, 400 feet. Uh, that's where you get capped usually as a UAV operator. Uh, I have to apply basically for a special uh, permission to do, uh, to do the 600. Uh, we used to do, last year we were doing 900 actually. And uh, I've been trying to bring it down, you know, but you, know, you don't want to go too down, too far down because then it's less safe for the plane too. If something happens, you have that much less time to try to deal with the situation, right? Um, but, uh, uh, 600 that seems to be a nice height right now when you know we're getting great imagery uh, the uh, the resolution is going to be higher obviously too because you're lower right so uh so that seems to work so that's what we do 
but uh, is that your own home built? Did you uh, this one is a home built. Yeah, uh, that's uh, you know trying to keep the cost down. So <laughs> no, landing uh, gear. no landing gear. No, it's it's a, uh, it's a belly lander. It's a carbon fiber fuselage, and so uh, so it's pretty robust. It can land on anything. Flaps on landing. Yeah, flaps on landing because it's pretty heavy. Yeah, with extra batteries. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple of fields actually that uh, might be flying later. So uh, uh, I did have to notify uh, uh, TC about uh, about that. It's uh, there by Brooks. Um, so that's it. So how many planes have you lost? Well, funny you mention that. Uh, last uh, year I lost uh, two. They were fine uh, all season, and on the last job it was the same site. I lost both. <laughs> So one, I, I suspect it was a stripped servo, you know, so when that happens on the aileron, for example, uh, you know, it's doomed, right? You can't do anything. And the other one, uh, it may have been uh, actually uh, uh, just uh, uh, radio interference. There was a huge tower near where we were flying, and sometimes they operate at a, the same or very similar frequency to what we have. And uh, so that's, uh, what, that's a suspicion. We never confirmed it. There's really no way. But uh, yeah, there's, there's that chance. <laughs> So just like any plane, you know, you kind of have to, uh, you look it over at the end of every flight, make sure everything is still tight or loose or whatever it needs to be. And, uh, and don't take any chances. Yeah. My question for Chris, I know you're, you're very new on the project and, and I do understand that there's a lot of interest and a lot of buzz, but what are some of the, the real barriers to say practical adoption of this type of technology. I know that I've heard that there, there could be issues with um, with how those photos are stitched together and what that might cause as far as different um, color patterns. And then there's issues regarding the digital nature, not being able to say combine fields uh, data because it's a relative measurement and sort of the timeliness that's, that's needed for it. I know there's the data processing end of it takes time before a farmer can practically you know, act on the information that they've achieved and hopefully you know, get a return on investment for, for what they're doing. Well, these are good points, uh, um, Ken, and we looked at those things and that this is more yeah. basically uh, brought us to this project, you know, to sort of figure out what those limitations are and sort of get a better handle on the real potential. And uh, I think that the most, what I can tell so far, the most important uh, limitation is that you have to get this information very rapidly out right so i was this year was a late year you know we had to people had to spray that there wasn't much time between uh, making a decision what needs to be sprayed and then going out there right so so uh, that needs to happen on, uh, on a, you know, a very quick turnaround and then uh, in this case you know the actual information you get with this particular approach we're doing for as far as weed management is concerned is um, is limited you know it's not uh, at this stage I mean, we can't really use it that much for, for weed management purposes now there may be other things where it may be more useful and i think more uh, like in the in this time of the year where uh, you have a little more time and and uh, the types of things you um, uh, the type of information you get is maybe you don't need to act on right away maybe it's more things like that help you make future decisions uh, that have, may have to do with varieties, that may have to do with, uh, say, you have lodging issues in your crop, uh, maybe you have things like uh, insect problems, like we would, uh, found out that cutworms are actually quite easily uh, spotted with that. Uh, so uh, there may be an application of this sort, but right now the limitation is, you know, we have the, the technologies there to generate those images. That can be done and we could do it, like as we set up right now, I mean, uh, Young can do it, uh, basically well, we push things at a on a 24 24 hour turnaround right can be done but uh, it's how are you going to interpret this and and this is not something that you know you need to uh, the value of these these maps is, is only once you ha can put them together over several years you know you and you, ha you set up you have the equipment to i mean i mean the computer equipment the software to, to deal with maps you know uh, that is still something that needs to be developed Right? And I think this is where uh, the real value comes into play. And, and this is, so taking the imagery is just a, it's just a raw product. You know? The value in itself, that it has to be derived from the interpretation of those images. And this is where the, the, uh, the real development needs to happen. And this is where the, the real value is as well. Right? So you can come and uh, you mean you gen maybe you're, not, you're, a, you're a consultant and you, uh, you have these images and this information uh, at your fingertips. 
uh, preferably multi-year, you know, and then you can pre present this to your client and say, well, you know what, uh, based on what I know, you should be doing this or that. And you don't overwhelm the, the farmer with showing them maps and maps, you know, there's nothing they can do with that. They need to be able to take this and then make either spray decisions or fertilizer decision or what have you, right? And, and, and this is what uh, I think is the job of a crop consultant to, uh, to develop this type of application. And, and this is where a lot of development still needs to happen. Any other questions for Chris or Jan? I bet you love going to work every day. I do. <laughs> Could be a little stressful, but uh, yeah. you know, when they're down on the ground, that's when I breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of fun, yeah. You may want to mention a uh, limitation is also wind speed. Uh, we can't uh, fly those on windy days. That's true. Uh, it has to be done uh, for the NDVI. It has to be done uh, during the day. Uh, you can't fly in the evening because the sun is too low, so you don't get the, the right spectrum. Uh, so well, a cloud-free day, right? And you, need a, you need yeah, sun. A cloudy day yeah. doesn't work that well either. So if it's very overcast, yeah. The so typically uh, with the fixed wing, uh, if the wind is over 20, it's more challenging uh, to fly it because it just it has to fight into the wind uh, that much more. So it you know takes up more battery power, right? Then you start running really low at the far end of the field sometimes. Uh, and uh, actually, the multi rotors are much more uh, forgiving when it comes to wind. Last week I was uh, doing a, a farm shoot uh, east of uh, Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta, and. Uh, Happened to pick a day when it was just gale force winds. If you remember last week, you know, like was it Thursday or Friday, 40, 50 kilometer an hour winds. So I actually flew that in 40 kilometer an hour winds, sustained and gusting to over 50. And I couldn't believe it, how, how stable that actually was. You know, I mean, it was still, it was at a 45 degree angle trying to counter the, the wind, but it still, it, it held position and uh, the pictures turned out great. So, uh, you know, that you can fly in wind, that not so much. <laughs> On the autopilot maybe yeah. side or uh, well so I run on a uh, micropilot autopilots uh, with the fixed wings so they're based out of uh, Stony Mountain Manitoba okay. and uh, uh, they I've been very happy with their systems they're just uh, it's it's a very steep learning curve when you first get it to uh, try to tune all the gains there I don't know 50 60 gains that you have to play with to tweak them to get it to fly like it's doing right now so it's very time consuming but once you get it going uh, it's once you have everything set properly uh, it's uh, it's very pleasurable uh, to fly and uh, the multi-rotor does not have a, a fully autonomous autopilot system in it even though that's what they call it it's a uh, it's a DJI product it's it's from Asia right uh, and uh, uh, it has a GPS hold and uh, uh, I guess a, a position hold so I can put it up in the air wherever I want uh, height wise and and positionally and then if you let go of the sticks on the transmitter if it has a GPS lock, it will just stay in that hover position in that location. And so it makes it a lot easier to uh, to take pictures that way because then I can just focus on panning the camera and getting the shot that I want you know, with a live uh, video feed from the camera so I can see on my monitor what I'm shooting. Um, so so that's, that's kind of the difference between these systems. But there are other systems, other uh, cheaper autopilots that uh, I hear perform uh, quite well as well. I, I just bought one recently that I haven't tested yet. Uh, so, uh, so there's a lot of those out there. Um, the what I like about this one is that uh, they uh, they don't have as many patches and, and upgrades to the firmware as some of these uh, lower end autopilots do. So uh, that was a conscious decision on my part to uh, not have to deal with that. So I just bought a good one and uh, been using it for uh, well, this is my uh, second year already actually of this one, and it's still doing great. So. Yeah.